2019 open. I've been using 2019 for a little while and actually there's a video coming out uh, very shortly that'll introduce you to 2019 and more of what it does and how it works. But in this video, we're just gonna create a real quick web application in first the .NET framework and then the .NET core. So we're going to look for ASP.NET. And now it's saying we want a core application. That's not right. Let's go back and look. There we go. ASP.NET web application.NET framework. So the first one by default, which is a good thing in my mind, the first one by default is ASP.NET core web application. But there's also ASP.NET web application.NET framework. We're going to select this one to get started so we have that .NET framework to remind ourselves of what an MVC application looks like. So we'll call this the full framework MVC. And we'll put this in my demo app location. And we'll call this the framework versus core app. Okay. And we're going to use .NET framework. Let's use the latest uh, 472, the latest one I have on my machine. 472 and hit create. And we're create an MVC application. We will, let's, let's include no authentication. We're going to use MVC, not web forms or API, no Docker support, and no unit tests. So hit create. And once that's done, we'll come back and do this again for another project and create a .NET Core project so you can kind of see them side by side. Okay, so there's the MVC application. I'll minimize that for now. Right click on my solution and say add new project. And this time I'm gonna select the ASP.NET Core web application. I hit next. And I wanna call this the Core MVC. We're going to select the web application model view controller, otherwise known as MVC. Now notice over here on the right, it says it's configured for HTTPS. I'm going to uncheck the Docker support. We won't, we won't need that, but it's there. We won't do authentication. We are using .NET Core 2.2. I could go to 3, but 3 is still not in release mode yet. And I'd rather stick with 2.2. For now. So MVC 2.2 HTTPS configured by default. Let's hit run this and see what we get. Okay, so this starting page looks very similar to the other one. And right now it's restoring, so it's already created, but it's still restoring the, um, the packages. So it's going to do that in the background for us, which is nice. So let's expand these two and look and see what the differences are. So first of all, in the full framework, we have references. And under references, we have a lot of these references. Now in the MVC, we have dependencies instead. And inside dependencies, one of them is NuGet. There's a couple of NuGet dependencies. Then we have our SDK, and that's which version of the .NET core comes with this application, then we have analyzers. So there's a lot less dependencies, or at least a lot less that are visible, but then of course you expand out .NET Core and there's quite a few inside there. And these have their own dependencies. So yes, there's a lot of dependencies still, but the way you see it seems a little bit easier to, to read through and understand. So we can see that we call it references down here, but it's really just dependencies up here. It, I think it's a better word to call it dependencies because our MVC application is dependent on the things inside of the dependencies folder. Whereas our full framework application is dependent on all these references. So it's, it's a, same, a similar concept, I think a better name and it's better grouping as well. Okay, if we come down to 
in our core, we have www root. We don't have a, an analog to that down here in the full framework. This www root is where we store our static files, things like our CSS, our JavaScript, even static HTML pages can go in here. We don't have that type of thing in our MVC application. So for example, this, the icon for our website lives inside www root, but down here in MVC, it lives right in the, the main folder. It's a little difference, a little bit more separation, better understanding of what goes where. Next, we have the three folders for controllers, models, and views, which we have controllers, models, and views as well. But then we have some interspersed things as well. For example, app data, app start, content, fonts, scripts, and of course the, the fave icon. So that's where, again, it's a little cleaner up here because you can put those things like fonts they would go in the www root folder because they're static files. So it kind of cleans it up and it brings it down to a little more understandable what's going on with MVC. You've got three folders, controllers, models, and views. It makes a little more sense, I think. So, so far it's just been cosmetic changes. We've renamed dependencies. We've moved things around a little bit, hidden things under the www root, but we're going to get into some more concrete details here in a minute. For example, we have app settings.json. This is where we store all of our configuration. For example, if we have a connection to a database that would go in here possibly, but, and this is where ASP.net and .NET core in general kind of takes it to the next level compared to the full framework. This is just one type of configuration option for .NET Core. And in fact, it's not the configuration option they would recommend for things like connection strings. Everyone's concerned about connection strings for good reason. They give away the security of your database. Now, for a web application, not a huge deal because you control the web server, but it's still something to consider it of. Well, with core applications, there's a stack of different options. For example, Azure Key Vault, which is in Azure, it's very, very cheap, and it stores securely and encrypted your most sensitive information, and that can plug in just like it was here in your app settings.json. And in fact, it will look in multiple locations, and based upon your priority, it will select the highest priority one that it finds. So you can have your app settings.json for your local development, but then have your Azure Key Vault override that automatically in production, even in dev or staging. So really uh, the next level. Also, this is JSON. Very easy to write, very easy to configure, and very easy to read when it comes to pulling information into your C Sharp application. The analog to this is the web config. Much more stuff here, and it's XML. Hard to write to, hard to read, hard to create uh, systems that actually work the way you expect them to. So definitely an upgrade there. Also, web.config doesn't have great ways of overriding it. It does have some ways. There's config transforms and things like that you can do, but it pretty much is saying, if you're looking for the web config, I'm always going to web config. I'm not going to go to Azure when I've got the web config. So that's kind of a downside of the .NET framework. Okay. So now let's actually look at what the code behinds for these controllers look like. The controllers kind of run an MVC application. Here is our full framework controller. It looks pretty standard. Now, of course, it's pretty much empty as well. Let's go to our home controller in .NET Core. It also looks pretty standard. In fact, the differences are really minor. 
we still have return view. We still name things and then create the views to match that name. So privacy, I knew that was here because we have a privacy method. So it's pretty much the same thing as our full framework. About, therefore I can find about down here in views. Home, about. Okay, so the controllers look almost the same. The code is fairly similar. Let's look at the views. So look at that privacy view. Can you tell that's .NET Core, not .NET Framework? Not really. It's pretty close to the same thing as what you'll find in .NET Framework. So there's not a lot changed as far as you can jump right into .NET Core and most of the stuff is just gonna work the same way. That's a really big deal. Now let's look at the layout page. This is the layout page for .NET Core. And we'll close the other ones for a minute. And let's go look at the layout page for the full framework. Now, there are some differences here. For example, we have this at styles.render and then the path to our CSS. Here, this is how we're pulling in our CSS from Twitter Bootstrap. Well, that's just a, a regular link with a relative path. But notice it's wrapped in include development. So saying this environment is for development. Whereas for this environment, which excludes development, we've got a different link for the same thing but it goes to the CDN, the Content Delivery Network. So in .NET Core, we have the ability to say, well, if you're in dev, do this. But if you're in production, do something a little bit different. The benefit here is in production, we're gonna look at a Content Delivery Network which speeds up our client's downloading of the CSS because it's more easily cached. However, if you're a developer working offline, or working on a plane, or whatever, you might not want to go out to the CDN all the time to get your CSS. And it's just faster in general to have it local. So you can use a local version that you've downloaded, but you use the CDN version for production. No other change is necessary, no toggling back and forth or remembering to make that switch. It's done for you. Plus, you have a fallback so that the customer can fall back to the version that you normally use in development, just in case, for whatever reason, Cloudflare goes down. So cool stuff like that, some definite upgrades to how we talk to controllers. So for example, this link says, in the home controller, call the index action. It's a little different here. We have HTML, action, link, home, index, home, it's a little more ugly. This looks a lot more like just straight HTML, which is pretty close to what it is. So there's a lot of stuff in here. These are called tag helpers. So ASP dash is a tag helper and there's lots of them, but yet they're context aware. So a tag helper for a list item is not the same list of tag helpers as the list in a anchor tag. So definite upgrades here as well. So overall, we've seen that .NET Core just kind of takes it to the next level. There's little tweaks here and there, and there's bigger tweaks as well that just make it better, make it easier. And so that's one of the, the big things about .NET Core that people often overlook. It's not just that it's cross-platform, and that is a big deal. .NET Core will run on Windows, Mac or Linux. That means that all the very, very cheap Linux servers out there, they can run .NET Core. That's a big deal, but that's not the only deal about .NET Core. And that's the message that's kind of gotten lost sometimes. One of the other big deals about .NET Core is it's a general overall upgrade 
to how we work with the language. It's easier. It's more, th- I want to say more thought out. That's not really the right word because the .NET framework was definitely thought out. It's just that they took all the things they learned from the .NET framework and said, what bugs us? What do we wish we could change, but we can't now because we've got a bunch of legacy stuff. And so they took those lessons learned and improved for .NET Core. .NET Core throws away a lot of legacy stuff the .NET framework has and has dependencies on, and it starts over. And so because of that, it's much, much faster as well. So you got a language that's faster. you got a language that's easier as a developer to work with. You've got a language that is based upon the shoulders of giants and doesn't have all the legacy that the giants do that, that first created this stuff. So faster, easier, better. That's what .NET Core is. So as we've seen here, it's not scary to move over. The code looks very, very similar. It's easier in how we do the work. It's more thought through and understandable when it comes to where's my stuff. And generally, it's just a lower barrier to entry than the .NET framework is. So the question comes up, when do you use .NET Core versus .NET Framework? Well, first of all, the .NET Framework is here for a long time. That's because the industry that uses .NET is mostly still in the .NET Framework. So what that means is you can't just say, I'm only ever going to do .NET Core from now on. .NET Framework is still a very, very viable tool for development, and it will be developed in for years to come. Microsoft will be supporting it for years to come. But for brand new development, .NET Core is the way to go. Now, there's other benefits here for the .NET Framework than just legacy. There's also the idea there's a lot more support out there for the .NET framework. So you have to look at what NuGet packages do you want? What third-party libraries do you want? What third-party DLLs that maybe are company DLLs or um, DLLs that you've been working with with before that you have to take a dependency on, what do they support? Because if they don't support .NET Core, you really can't go to .NET Core at least not without losing that dependency. On the other hand, if you're looking at .NET Core versus .NET Framework, the .NET Core side of things, you've got the cross-platform. You've got the better, faster, and easier. Also, though, if you're looking to target microservices or work with Docker or really need some high-performance, scalable systems, that's where... You're going to look at the the .NET Core side of things and start moving that direction. One of the neat things about .NET Core is one of these dependencies is the SDK. What that means is what version of .NET Core do I depend on? Because that's really a dependency. It depends on .NET Core. The cool thing is it takes that dependency with it. So when you package it up and deploy it somewhere, it's going to take .NET Core 2.2 with it so that you can run a .NET Core 2.2 app right next to a .NET Core 3.0 app with no problems. Okay, so that's something that .NET Framework has struggled with. And when you went to install things, you had to have a .NET Framework on that machine or you had to install it. Well, not with .NET Core. Because .NET Core goes with the application. Now, upcoming in .NET Core 3.0, .NET Core is going to come to WPF and WinForms. Now, at first, you may say, that's amazing. We're going to have desktop applications on Mac and Linux. Sorry, it's not the case. That's not what they're doing with, with those platforms because 
Win forms, it's even, even the name. It depends on Windows. And the same at WPF, the W stands for Windows. But what it will allow is it will allow that backend code to be the easier, faster, better code base than the full .NET framework. That means that even if you're running desktop applications on Windows, Microsoft is still saying the better choice here is .NET Core going forward. So just keep that in mind as well. So we've got these two different frameworks, the .NET Core and the full .NET framework. Which one you choose depends a lot on where you want to go. If you're looking to get a job, you're going to want to know both because one of the big things coming up for a lot of companies is how we move our .NET framework applications over to .NET Core. That's why with my Timco Retail Manager series, I'm building everything in .NET Framework, which may seem counterintuitive, but what I want is a full set of applications that are in the .NET Framework so that we can simulate what you will see in the job market, which is we're going to take these full .NET Framework applications and see how we can move those over to .NET Core and then see if I can break them apart into many microservices and use Docker for some things and things like that. Now, if you're just starting out building applications and you're gonna build your applications for yourself, I would definitely recommend starting in .NET Core. A lot of the stuff you'll learn in .NET Framework is still very, very valuable because it's pretty close or the same as in the .NET Core. So don't shy away from learning things if they're not .NET Core. But going forward with your actual development, develop in .NET Core. If you're working in a business that uses .NET Framework, definitely still learn and grow in .NET Framework, but also start dabbling in .NET Core. Start building applications because sooner or later, you're going to be presented with the opportunity to start moving things over and you need to be ready for that. Now, one more benefit I haven't really mentioned yet, but .NET Core, since it can run on Linux and, and Mac, it can also be built on Linux and Mac. That means you don't have to have Windows or Visual Studio in order to build .NET Core applications. So, a couple of recommendations. First of all, if you're on a Mac, there is Visual Studio for the Mac. But there's also, whatever platform you're on, including Windows, there's VS Code or Visual Studio Code. It's free, it's open source, and it's one of the fastest growing web tools out there because it's amazing. And one of the things it can do is it can build .NET Core applications. So check those out. Go to visualstudio.com. You can download any of those and get started right away building .NET Core apps. Now, I do have a course out called Getting Started with .NET Core. Might wanna check that out. That's gonna go through all the different, uh, goes through console and Razor page applications and MVC and API. It goes through authentication. It goes through um, some of the other security stuff that's baked right into this platform. It's